Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Snyder, president of Case Western Reserve University, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's Power of Diversity lecture. This series is now in its second year and is sponsored by our Office of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity. It features appearances by members of our own faculty as well as distinguished thought leaders from across the country. No matter who is speaking, the goal is the same to deepen understanding, encourage dialogue, and increase campus-wide engagement regarding questions of inclusion and diversity. This series is one of several initiatives that I'm proud to say uh, was launched by Dr. Marilyn Mobley when she became our first Vice President for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity in 2009. This year, before our community, um, or the, the, that year, in 2009, when she came, our community had identified diversity the year before as a core value in our strategic plan, the one that was approved in 2008, and the one that we call forward thinking. We know that diversity of thought and perspective and experience are all essential to our role as an institution of higher education. Seldom does any issue ever have just one side. The more complex our society becomes, the greater the need for multiple voices to be heard to help us understand and address the challenges we face. To that end, Dr. Mobley has launched a strategic planning process of her own, building on the one the university conducted in 2007-2008. And she is creating from that process a strategic plan for diversity. That plan is now in its second draft, and she welcomes comments from all of you. I hope you will take the time, whether you're a member of our community or not, to take a look at the draft plan. It is on the diversity website, which which you can find at www.case.edu backslash diversity. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mobley to the podium where she will introduce our very distinguished speaker for today. Thank you. Thank you, President Snyder. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Office of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity, I welcome you to this event as well. We have been eagerly awaiting Luke Visconti's visit, not only because we know him to be a fearless diversity professional, fearless, fearless diversity professional, but also because our work in both higher education and corporate sectors have benefited from his attention to inclusive excellence. Here at Case Western Reserve, we are advancing diversity through inclusive thinking, mindful learning, and transformative dialogue with the goal of creating a welcoming environment for all of our faculty, students, alumni, and community and corporate partners. It is good work, it is critical work, and it is important work if we are going to have a competitive nation with an educated citizenry that is culturally competent. James Anderson in his book, Driving Change Through Diversity and Globalization, Transformative Leadership in the Academy says the following, and some people have heard me quote this often because I believe it's true, the readiness of a college or university to confront its 21st century responsibilities is directly correlated with the degree to which it has embedded diversity and globalization concerns into the basic philosophy and in infrastructure of the institution. As President Snyder just um, suggested, that's the very thing we've been trying to do out of our office and with the help of our campus community. Today's program is in honor of Case Western Reserve's commitment to diversity as a core value as articulated in our strategic plan. Moreover, as President Snyder just mentioned, we have the diversity strategic action plan in its second draft, which was created with help from our Diversity Leadership Council, feedback from key stakeholders, including our senior leadership team, faculty, students, and staff to confirm that commitment. Because we understand that diversity is based on an educational case, a business case, and an economic case, all three, this series began last year with Professor Charles Ogletree and Dr. Julianne Malvo. Now with today's guest, we are turning to the business case for diversity. Luke Visconti is chief 
Chief Executive Officer, okay, I got it, I got it. <laughs> Chief Executive Officer of Diversity Inc. Magazine. He has been publishing Diversity Inc. for 12 years since founding the company in 1998. I'm pleased to say the Case Western Reserve was included in the spring 2011 special Cleveland issue as one of the local organizations recognized for workforce diversity by the Commission on Economic Inclusion of the Greater Cleveland Partnership. Many of us in the field of diversity and inclusion, and I I thank my fellow diversity professionals who are here, I see you, I know you, refer to his top 50 list every year to see who's in and who's out. Um, some of the local companies that have been recognized include Key Bank, Kaiser Permanente, Cleveland Clinic, University Hospital, Forest City Enterprises, among others in the Cleveland area. We have come to enjoy the unique perspective of his Ask the White Guy column and appreciate that each issue of his magazine seeks to deepen our understanding of the complexity of diversity in the workplace, on campus, in our nation, and in our world. He serves on the Board of Trustees at Bennett College for Women, I wonder if that could be where I met him, and on the Educational Opportunity Funds at both Camden and Newark campuses at Rutgers University. His degree was in biology as a student there at Rutgers, and today his lecture for us is on innovation and diversity, what does success look like? For being a strong, dynamic leader who not only gets diversity but knows how to talk about it at all levels with leaders at all levels, I ask you to join me in giving a warm welcome to Cleveland and to Case Western Reserve University to Luke Visconti. Thank you. Well, thank you for your warm welcome. I, I have to say I'm here in Northeast Ohio more than anywhere else in the country. And um, I, you know, I always wondered about that. I bought a building for my own company that um, the local history was that it was, on a, it was a stop on the Underground Railroad. So I wanted to do research on it and I found a book by a man named Siebert that seemed to be the volume of work for the Underground Railroad and in it had a folding map. And it really became clear to me why I'm here all the time. If you know where the Underground Railroad went through through, Ohio was a critical state. So I believe there's legacy of both good and evil, and, and you may have read in the newspaper uh, how Alabama, after passing laws that required local authorities to report on uh, uh, both documented and undocumented immigrants, uh, emptied its public schools of its Latino students, emptied them, they disappeared. There's a legacy of evil, too, you see. If there's a legacy of evil as well as good, but this is a good state, uh, and you've invited me here over and over again, and I appreciate it. And I like Ohio. Now, if we could just do something about the weather in New Jersey and Ohio in the winter, right? Uh, you may wonder, OK, how did I end up being here in front of you? Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about that before I get started. Uh, I have a biology degree. I'm also a distinguished alumnus of, of Rutgers University. But I had to apologize that night when I got that award for the other distinguished alumni because I lowered our aggregate GPA by probably a full point. I apologize for that. I was a, I was a horrible student. Uh, and now I'm a trustee of the university. And, and it's interesting how things come around. But how how I ended up here in front of you today um, has a lot to do with uh, just choices you make and serendipity and if you can keep your ears open. Uh, I left uh, Rutgers, I got my degree and I went immediately into the Navy's flight program. Uh, I survived four months with the Marines, got my commission, survived flight school, uh, got my wings, I flew in the fleet, uh, and then it was the end of the Cold War, so I volunteered for recruiting duty, which isn't ordinary, so they usually give you your choice. And if any of you are veterans, you might remember, they call it a dream sheet. You, you list five things that you want. And so I don't like cold weather, so I listed LA, San Diego, Houston, Dallas, Atlanta. I wrote in Miami me and I waited six weeks to get my orders back and open up the envelope and oh, where am I going to go and it says New Jersey. So I flew all the way to Washington to argue and they said you're from New Jersey and I said yes. And they said well you don't think anybody who's not from New Jersey is asking me to go there do you? And I said no. And they, so I went to New Jersey but on my way I called my new boss and I said um, I'm on my way, just wanted you to know that I'm coming. And she said, well, good, I'm glad you called because we have an open billet for the minority officer recruiter, but you don't have to take it because it's not for everybody. 
Now, my parents didn't tolerate bigoted talk in the house. They weren't activists or anything. They just didn't want it in the house. And I was in a fraternity at Rutgers um, that had black brothers and Latino brothers and Asian brothers, which in the late 70s was pretty rare. So I said, sure, XO, I'll, I'll take that job. And when I got to the district, I walked in, and there happened to be another aviator there. And, and when you're in the military, you kind of can read a person almost immediately. You have ribbons, and you have wings, or whatever you have, and rank. And so I looked at him. I knew he was an aviator. I could tell he was a Naval Academy grad, because he had a Naval Academy ring. He's African American. His name's Tony Cato. So we started talking. And he was only there temporarily. He was going to leave the Navy. And, but he said, you know, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm the minority officer recruiter. And he laughed. And he goes, I guess you were the best they could do. And I said, yeah, I guess so. And he said, would you like my help? And I said, boy, that's a generous offer. Yes, I'd love your help. And so we traveled around for his last five months on active duty. And he would tell me about ways that he was discriminated against. And he wasn't doing this to, he, Tony's a natural born professor. He's also a great husband. He's married now over 30 years. He's a great father. His little boys have grown up. They're successful men. Uh, he's just a natural professor. He talks. And he likes to tell people, give people insight. And so he was telling me about ways that he had been discriminated against. And my first reaction was, oh, come on, Tony. They couldn't have meant it that way. You're being too sensitive. Uh, come on, it couldn't have happened more than once like that. Until finally one day, we were in the car together. And he was, we were talking about what we like to do on long drives. And he said he had a box of Martin Luther King's speeches on cassette tape in the back of his, in the trunk of his car, and that he would listen to speeches on long drives. And he was driving, I looked at him to see if he was trying to make a point with me, and he wasn't, he was just talking. And I thought to myself, I read almost nothing but American history, and I have no real connection with Martin Luther King. And my friend Tony, who's an amazing officer, great pilot, father, husband, a guy I really respect, has this personal relationship. What am I missing? And it slowly started to sink into my head that I was missing a great deal, and that my imprimatur was being a white, heterosexual, Christian man with no ADA-defined disabilities limited my perspective quite a bit. And it got me thinking. And that's how I end up here. And, and, and it happened in the 80s. And I end up here in front of you today. It's been a long process of taking in information and digesting it. And I think, you know, so I'm going to try to bring to you today some compelling evidence and information and research about why your university and the city of Cleveland and the state of Ohio should be viewing this as a compelling factor in being sustainable. And it's a very important factor in being sustainable. We're going to talk about it from a context of, um, uh oh, next. That'll do. Context of business, but what I want to start with, uh, I was going to a pharmaceutical company, and they were saying, uh, well, what's the proof? What's the proof about innovation and diversity? And I'll talk about why innovation um, in a little bit, but let's just say that innovation is important at this point. What's the proof? And if you look, there's, there is some proof. This is a study uh, by Professor Ron Burt that he did um, a series of surveys with employees uh, and, uh, and, and asked them for their ideas and then asked them about themselves. And he measured the diversity of a person's relationships versus the quality of their ideas. And there was a strong correlation. Also. The man who wrote The Wisdom of Crowds had a couple of things to say in his speech. Innovations emerge best from communities rather than a mythical lone investor. Inventor, rather. Random group may have lower average IQs than the best of best group, but diversity gives the random group higher collective intelligence. I want to talk a little bit later about, well, how do you determine who's intelligent and who's not? Uh, people will make mistakes in judgment. The key is to get the crowd to make mistakes in different areas, not in the same way. That's the basis of innovation. Uh, I would say that there's another part of this that we should all keep in mind when you're talking about this subject, because subject forces you into a corner that you must answer one fundamental question. And that question is, 
do you believe people are created equally? Because if you're gonna tell me that people are created equally, then talent, talent is distributed equally as well. And therefore, if you can convene a room and there's not equitable representation, I can tell you you've got a loss in quality. That, that is just a mathematical fact. If you have a large enough sample and you don't have equity, you have had a loss in quality. Now people will say, well Luke, what about preparation? What about education? And I will tell you that the expensive part for business is finding talent. The less expensive part by a large factor is preparing that talent. That's not very expensive. Finding the talents is, is the expensive part. So if you're thinking about innovation and diversity, to have the brains in the room to come up with the ideas, to start with, you have to have diversity. This is a mathematical fact of life. Unless, of course, you want to tell me that people aren't created equally, that there's somehow something mysteriously so important and special about white men then, well, okay, we have another conversation about bigotry, but that's a whole different thing. I would assume that most people uh, who run Fortune 500 companies are not bigots or misogynists or homophobes, yet look at the board of directors, look at the executive committees of most companies, and you'll see mostly white men. I'll have some more about that in, in a little bit. We've been measuring corporate diversity efforts. We're in our 12th year, and the issue in front of you is the diversity ain't top 50 companies for diversity. It is a survey, it's 300 fields of data. We use SPSS to crunch the data. There is no relationship between the results and being on my list and business conducted with my company. Uh, we have three companies on the top 50 list that do no business with me whatsoever. General Mills, Cummins Engine, and um, uh, third one's not on my, I have a mental block. It's a mental block because it's annoying, frankly, that you know, they'd be on my list year after year and not do any business with me, but it's an editorial function, that's the way it works out. We look at four areas, CEO commitment, which is the most important, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, human capital, and we focus on race and gender. Why? Because corporations must track that very carefully. Issues of disability and orientation are not tracked legally and therefore the data is not as comprehensive. It's not that we want to leave that on the table. So we look at that, we look at supplier diversity and we look at internal and external communications. What I've found in doing this is that there's five stages of diversity. You'll see four here. What's the stage zero is nothing. When we started doing this over 10 years ago, I would say that at, at least you have more, far more than half of the Fortune 500 companies were stage zero. They were doing nothing about diversity. And now more than half are. Uh, but stage one, and you'll see the sombrero there. Why a sombrero? Anybody want to guess? You get tacos in the cafeteria on the 5th of May, Cinco de Mayo, right? That's your diversity effort. It's a little celebration. You get some food. It's not bad. But we benchmark companies. And we're finding companies in stage one are actually recruiting less diversity than they currently have in their workforce. Now you probably know that our country is going to become less than 50% white by 2043. And if you look at high school graduation, college graduation, and postgraduate degree attainment, it is more diverse, it's growing more rapidly than the growth in the populations of blacks, Latinos, and Asians. So think about that. These are companies recruiting in reverse of the talent pool. That's a pretty tough thing. When you're looking at that kind of poor performance, your quality is, is descending rapidly. Why? You are taking an increasing cut of a decreasing part of the pie, white people. You're taking an increasing cut of a decreasing part of the pie. So what do you think you're going to get? Lower and lower and lower quality. And here's kind of an insidious thing that you wouldn't recognize optically. The people who are the most progressive, outgoing, thoughtful, intelligent, prepared, white, black, Asian, whatever, are also looking for that kind of an environment. So what kind of environment do you think you have when your diversity's decreasing? Not the one that the smart white kids are looking for, even. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not just about blacks, Latinos, and Asians. It's about your total population of employees. Stage two is, if you look at our list, most of the companies on our list are stage two companies. 
They have a, a diversity plan with actions, objectives, and milestones. They have positive gains in diversity and engagement. They have structured employee resource groups, that's what an ERG is, and mentoring. They have a denial of, stage to, of talent to stage one companies. So they are denying stage one competitors that talent because they're just aggressively going out and reaching out. Stage three is marketplace focus. And, and, and what is this, by the way? What, what, what does this define? And it's most basic form, it's just creating a, a, a relationship, right? You're getting to know people. And as a reader pointed out to me, I'm not different than you, I'm different like you. We're different, so you change the pronouns from them and those people, right, to we and our and us. That's what this is all about. Now, if you have a good relationship with your employees and internally, what can you do then? You could turn around to the marketplace and create that we and us and our. I heard this the best, um, interesting, uh, the CEO of Empire Blue Cross, that's the Blue Cross Blue Shield in New York. White guy, he's, he's six foot 10. And I was standing next to him and I go, dude, just how tall are you? And he, he said, guess. And I said, I don't know, six, seven? And he said, no, between six, nine and six, 10, depends on the day. So he talked about the people of New York and his employees and his customers all in one big pot, it was us and we and our, and we do this and our way of looking at things. It was so beautiful, you could tell that he truly believed that this was his greater family, that he was providing health insurance for, and he was very concerned about them. So he went out, and you think about what that means when you can go to the marketplace. Most things can be boiled down to a commodity if you don't have a relationship with your customer. I want you to think about what's going on in banking right now. I know, did you hear about having a, you know, now your ATM card is gonna cost you a certain amount of money every month. Um, you know, it might be $5 at Bank of America, other banks, because the, you know, they, they need to get money from someplace since interest rates have been cut out from under them. So I want you to think about this, what's your, What's the difference in your perception between banks? Well, it's not very great if they don't have a relationship with you. You'll leave them in a heartbeat over $5 a month. Why not? So the key is, if you could take the development of we and us and our and put it out to your customers, wow, does that really make a difference? It sure does. And I'll give you, you know, it's not just business to consumer, it's also business to business. I talked about earlier um, in conjunction with supplier diversity. I got an email from a woman uh, from a law firm and she wanted me to speak at her law firm near Washington, D.C. So I called her up and on the phone we were talking and I said, so uh, Angela, are you African American? And she said, yes. And I said, well, I'm looking at the pictures of your partners at the law firm. She's a partner at this firm. I said, I don't see you because there's nothing but white people, 300 partners in a law firm near Washington, D.C. Now I want you to think about that, the mighty effort that you have to undertake as a law firm to exclude black people from your partnership in 2011 in Washington, D.C. Think about how hard you have to try to exclude people to end up, so I said to Angela, I said, so Angela, why should I come and speak to your all white but you law firm about diversity? And she told me, we got turned down for outside counsel work by Verizon and Sodexo, two companies that have been on my list for years. So now all of a sudden the senior partners are very concerned about diversity and they wanted me to come help them with this. And so I went down there and I talked to them and it went right over their heads. There was just no way, I mean look, if you labor for decades to become the senior partner in a law firm and it looks okay to you to be near Washington DC on a metro stop you could go take the metro right into downtown and your whole law firm's white and that's okay what am I gonna say so anyway it's not just B it's not B to B it's B to C as well um, finally and we're just now starting to see companies become stage four companies this is where you incorporate the relationship that you have with people, that you respect people for who they are, that you're not trying to make your black women into white men in your head, that you're not saying, oh, well, you're not like them, you're like, you're not like one of them, you're like one of us. You're not saying those things, those things aren't going through your head. Then you bring in that diversity with its different perspectives and you create innovation out of it. Now I want you to think about what this innovation means. 
Could you 10 years ago, and most of you were, well, there's some students here, but think about we baby boomers. 10 years ago, did you think you were going to put your hand on something this big on a piece of glass and move things around? I mean, it's really unbelievable what's happened in a decade. It, and if you think about this, it's not just for us. Look this up. Look, go, go back to your computer and look this up. Africa cell phone business. And look at it. Look at the ads. The ads for cell phone use in, in sub-Saharan Africa are all about using your cell phone as a wallet. Because one way of oppressing people is to prevent them from using currency or banks. How do you amass wealth if you, can't, if you don't have currency and you don't have a bank account? Well, guess what? You skip over a whole generation of technology by having a, a cell phone. And, and look this up as well. There's things called charging stations. And when I first saw these pictures, I was like, well, why are these charging stations in town? And they'd be in town, there'd be a, a power pole, and all these cell phones would be charging up. Why? Because the people don't have electricity in their houses. So they have a cell phone. Can you imagine the innovation that's going to come out of that use of my goodness, the transcending. So you think about all of the different ways of looking at things and pulling that, if you could pull that in and energize your decision making and your innovation, you have a leg up on your competitor that can't. <coughs> your competitor who's still having tacos in the cafeteria and that's about the extent of it. Or even the competitor who's doing a good job with their workforce. If you could spin that around and create innovation out of it, you will beat everybody. Now, how does this happen? It starts from the top. I actually got a question to my column. Have you ever seen evidence of a trickle up, uh, you know, a diversity effort that started with the, with the workforce? And it's not a single one in 12 years of looking at these things. If it doesn't start at the top with clear, demonstrated, communicated issues of diversity and holding people accountable, you will not be successful. Um, Purposeful management breaks through these tribal barriers that we all have. And I always make a point of, um, the, the, and I guess I asked this question, I'm going to have to go back to the column. I got asked, what was the worst question you ever received? The worst question I ever received was from a professor at a public university in the Midwest. And he said, a professor of biology, who said, um, Eskimos can handle the cold better than people in Thailand. Uh, black people score lower on SATs than white people. Don't you think there's an element of uh, genetics and intelligence and race? And uh, so yeah, right. so I, I got this question. And I thought, and I said, OK, I better do some research. And what you find is that the geneticists have proven one thing, that the, our concept of race, the commonly held concept of race, doesn't exist, that we're one human species, we're human beings, that's it. And the National Geographic Human Genomic Project proves we're all from Africa. And it's only been a few hundred thousand years we've been wandering the earth, right? And why, are we, why do we look different? Well, think about it. If you took cats or pigeons or corn and geographically isolated it and had it grow together over a period of time, it would all look the same. And indeed, about 4% of our genome that deals with hair texture and eye folds and skin color has nothing to do with intelligence. But what's our dominant sense? Vision. So we look in a room like this and start separating out for tribe. Why? Well, it wasn't that long ago that we were hunting and gathering for survival. So if your tribe gets to the antelope before my tribe does, you eat, I go hungry. Happens another day, I'm going to kill you and I'll probably eat you too. So I want you to think about that. That's human nature. I served on active duty for eight years. I was in the reserves for another year and a half. Uh, I was an aircraft commander and a functional check pilot. Had signing power over hydrogen bombs at 27, which now when I look at my 27-year-old employees, I wonder what on earth was anybody thinking. But the, the bottom line is, um, I'm proud of, of my service. I still serve. I'm on the Chief of Naval Operations Executive Panel. I still have, I have a top secret clearance. And we have 1,700 hydrogen bombs. Why? Are we ever going to launch 1,700 nuclear weapons at anybody? For what reason would we do that? If somebody attacked us, would we turn around? Do we have the guts to incinerate somebody else's non-combatants? Because somebody did that to us. I hope not. I hope we've moved past that. 
But think about it. I may have to kill you because you may get to the antelope a second day in a row. That's how primitive we are. We're just primitive, all of us. You scrape the veneer of civilization. You know how you do that? Turn off the electricity and the water for a few days. You'll see what you have. You'll see what you have. You'll be happy you have the Second Amendment. So bottom line is we are tribal. There's a little bigot running around inside of all of us. Everybody has that problem. So you have to have purposeful management in a diverse situation to bring in the best people and the best ideas. It must be purposeful to break down barriers. How do you do that? Mentoring, and I don't mean the arm around the shoulder kind of mentoring. I mean structured, tested, evaluated, surveyed, trained, uh, purposeful mentoring across cultures, cross genders, cross orientation, age, all of that, disabilities, resource groups. Now resource groups, uh, if you're a stage two company, might be the black employee resource group or the women's resource group. In a stage three company, now you're talking about the elder care resource group and the child, uh, young children resource group, and you're starting to utilize these things as a vector to get market information. Um, Regular, persistent, and consistent communications, critical, coming from the top. Um, I think that if you look at a company's transformation as the leader thinks, as the leader understands this concept of we and our and us and how it transforms their organization, you see other things happen. Philanthropy and supplier diversity starts taking on a whole new life. Now, those two aren't Together, there should be like a line between these because supplier diversity lowers your procurement costs, increases the innovation of your suppliers, and decreases your cycle time. So it's a business subject. This is about us, we, and our uh, to a greater degree when you think about it. If that's how you view people, well, if we're hungry, what are we going to do? We're to feed us, aren't we? If we are ignorant because our education system's broken, what are we going to do? We're going to correct that situation. Right? So that's about philanthropy, and, and it's very interesting. The diversity of top 50 companies average 2.4% of their gross revenue going to philanthropy. Um, and I want you to think about philanthropy from that term. Always look at gross revenue. Do not listen to companies that say, and I'll give you an example. $500,000 sounds like a lot of money. But I was at a Wall Street bank. A friend of mine asked me to speak, and their bank, was crowing in their annual report about their $500,000 donation to charity. Now this is a bank that has billions and billions of dollars. So to them, 500,000 was real laudable. I donate 200,000 a year. I mean, it's, it's, it's like that's nothing, it's a fleck. So just to, the way you compare apples to apples, always compare, and it's, it's available. Uh, Clorox one time, two years ago, sent me this real slick uh, corporate responsibility brochure, and they said, well, we're so philanthropic, and so I went back, and I, I, they didn't give me a percentage of gross revenue, so I added it up, and it was one one-hundredth of the average diversity. Inc yeah, well, to them, it was a lot of money. Without that relative understanding, you don't know what you're talking about, so just keep that in mind. There's our list. You'll see Kaiser Permanente's at the top. Um, their CEO is the most amazing guy I've ever met. I mean, he's a really incredible guy. Uh, it took me, he's a little bit introverted, and I was interviewing him, it took me four, 45 minutes to get to, you know, where is this coming from, George? Because he's a, one of the whitest white guys, you know, he's got a white beard, he's, he's a very white guy. And he's from Minnesota, you know, land of the white people. So it's like, how did George, how did you get so engaged in this? And 45 minutes into the conversation, he told me about, he had been a, a president of an HMO in Minnesota, and uh, President Reagan befriended the president of Jamaica, and he said, you should start an HMO. So they did a job search. George's name floated to the top, and he ends up being the only black employee of this entire HMO, or non-black employee of this entire HMO. And, and he said, it was a, he was talking about his experience, he said he was at a reggae festival, and he realized that of the thousands of people he was there, he was the only white person. And he had a panic attack, he told me this, and he said somebody came up to him and helped him sit down on the curb, because he was getting woozy. Now this is a guy who had the guts to tell me this, how cool is that? And, and then he told me about sense, going around from, from 
from village to village in Uganda signing people up for village co-ops. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So I'm like picturing this little guy like running around from village to village convincing people to sign up for insurance because that's Kaiser Permanente. He's got the most diverse board uh, of any company we measure and the most diverse direct reports to the CEO of any company we measure by far. You'll notice all four of the big four accounting firms are up there. You'll also notice that there's very labor-intensive companies like Sodexo, which provides cafeteria services, and Marriott, which is a whole hotel chain, and Starwood, mostly labor-intensive workers. So there's a, a big spread of companies that are up here. We do measure inside every industry so that we do factor for available pool. Now, what are the differences? between companies that apply, and last year we had 535 companies participate in the top 50 competition. So we look at the entire range. Now, I won't tell you who didn't make the list because it's unfair. They gave us our, their data. They're starting out, they want to be measured, but we won't reveal those names because people would unnecessarily think, well, these are the worst companies for diversity, and it's not true. So bottom quarter are the bottom quartile of all of the companies that have participated, and here's the top 50 list. So if you take a look at this, you have on the left percentage of employees and employee resource groups. The top 50 companies average 23%, which is double the what it was six years ago. The bottom quarter companies, 8%. Now turn around and look at this. Now this is promotions in management. We look at five levels of management. This is promotions in management. The bottom quartile, 40%. The top 50, 48%. Now I want you to think about this. Two things. Women are at parity with men in the labor force, both co uh, college educated and non-college educated. It's not quite 50-50, why? Anybody want to guess? What do women do that men don't do? Yes. My wife said if men bore 50% of the children, this would have been sorted out a long time ago, and I, I think she's right. So you think about that, yeah, right? <laughs> That's funny. Um, if you think about this, um, women have been getting more college degrees than men since when? What year? 80. 80. When was the last province of Switzerland that gave women the vote? Yes. Can you imagine this? So women, if you look at all Americans under 65, there are more women with four-year degrees than men. Now I want you to think about this. If you're not promoting 50% women, what do you've got? Less quality. It's just the way it is. And I want you to think about this from a business perspective, because I find this pretty amazing. What percentage of companies on the 1997 Fortune 500 list were still in existence 10 years later? 50%. What's the percentage of women on corporate boards, Fortune 500 boards? 14%. Three is the number percentage of Fortune 500 CEOs who are women. So do you think there's a connection between 3% and 50% of failure companies? I don't see why you wouldn't think there was a connection, right? And yet, if you watch CNBC, who do they have on all the time? Warren Buffett and Jack Welch, as if they're the gurus of business. When Jack Welch got to GE, they were already making locomotives. They didn't have, he didn't have to create anything, right? He didn't have to do anything. He was, they were already making stuff, right? And who's in Obama's cabinet to tell him about industry? Jeff Immel. Have you seen GE stock performance over the last decade? Why would you go to him for anything other than tax advice? Because you know what GE paid in taxes last year? Zero. That's right. Good attorneys. My wife goes, how come you're paying so much taxes? Honey, if I could afford their attorneys and, and, and their accountants, I wouldn't pay any taxes either. So I want you to think about this from the context of ERGs. What do they do? They build those connections. They make the women feel part of the organization. And they have the organization make sure that they're invested in their women because it's all important for business. Now. What's this? Can you read that? It says country club. What's this? Anybody want to hazard a guess? That's the white man's employee resource group. Right? Right? So you're a CEO, you're at your country club, and one of your friends comes up and says, hey, I'd like to introduce you to my son. He just graduated with a PhD in chemistry. Um, just wanted you to say, you say hello to the nice young man, you talk to him, and you say, you know what, here's my business card. You come to my office, I'm gonna show you around. That's how things work. Is there anything wrong with that? No, unless it's segregated to a very small percentage of the population, 
because only a very small percentage of the population will get that benefit of those relationships. That's what a resource group is for, okay? Democratize the process. Correlations. Percenters, uh, percentage of managers and mentoring, bottom quarter, 12%. That's the bottom quartile. Diversity in top 50, 39%. Another percentage that's doubled over the last six years. Promotions in managements, blacks, Latinos, and Asians. Now I'm just pulling two groups. We measured this for everybody, but just take a look at this. Bottom quarter, 17%. Top 50, 25%. If you're black, Latino, or Asian, where do you want to work? Here, please, right? And why? Well, how are you going to learn the ropes unless somebody takes the time to tell you? And is it in, in the company's best interest for you to know that or for you not to know that? Are they better off with you being ignorant or are they better off with you being knowledgeable? Well, if you're not thinking, ignorance is okay. If you're thinking you want the talent to rise to the top and mentoring is the vector to do that. I actually got this from a reader. When someone joins my group, I don't want an attitude that says, I am different and special, give me extra help to fit in. I want an engineer that says, how can I do my job the best and work with the team equally? Sounds logical, right? But if you looked at their board of directors and their executive committee, it was overwhelmingly white men. So I asked her, unless you're prepared to tell me that there's something very special about the white men in your company, that they're far more talented than everybody else, something went wrong. What went wrong was the process wasn't democratized. What went right for the right men, well, the white men were, think about this. What do you need to be successful? You need somebody to tell you, you're different. You're talented. I want to help you fit in so that you're successful. Isn't that right? I was uh, at Eli Lilly, and the CEO was talking about a, a friend of his son who joined the company and um, went to a remote location his first assignment and he called them up and said don't do that you stay in headquarters and make a name for yourself before you take a remote assignment do not let them send you to a remote assignment first that's good advice right but how are you going to know that how are you going to know that and one of the things that we're moving to measuring because i think it's important is the diversity of the king and queen maker division in the company. So in other words, there is every organization has the place from which the future leaders are going to be selected. In a hospital system, Donnie, it's not gonna be from customer service. It's just not. So you have to look at where's the diversity of the power player department and make sure that that's equitable as well. And then you'll end up with the best talent at the top because that's what this is all about. And speaking of talent, why do we need to discuss this? The obvious, right? Do you know what this is, this thing? Do you know what kind of car that is? It's a Pontiac Aztec, right? Maybe the ugliest car I've ever seen in my life. And it wasn't a great car, right? Now this is a company, GM, was making cars for 100 years when they came up with this beauty. And in a room someplace, somebody flashed this up on the screen and the whole group said, yeah, that's a great idea, Jack. Whoa, that's a great car. So we'll start with bad management, right? <laughs> bad management exhibits itself in any number of ways. Think about laptops, right? For years, we have been getting derivatives of the same laptop. I had, a, I had one of the first, it wasn't really a laptop, it was the IBM personal portable PC. It had two floppy drives, two five and a quarter inch floppy drives and no hard drive. So you loaded WordPerfect in on one floppy and you saved it on another floppy and this was a big deal because it was like this big and the keyboard flipped down, it had a green screen, you know, with the little green letters, it had no colors, just one color, green and black, you know, there was an absence of color and then there was green and that was it. And I was like, my God, you could carry this thing and move it from room to room. Now you couldn't talk to anybody, there was no internet, there was no modems, there was nothing, but it, it was mind boggling to me. And yet when you think about your latest laptop, except for the internet, which wasn't invented by the PC companies, it's basically a derivative of that first laptop. But what's an iPad? That's something completely different, absolute game changer. 
So we had all of those PC companies beating themselves over the head to produce the same thing, bad management. So what are the other things here? I think fear is a very, very big factor, and I end up talking to a lot of audiences where there's almost no white men. And when you think about it, this room should be dominated by white men because white men need to hear this message more than any other group. So it becomes incumbent upon me to tell you, the oppressed, that it's on your shoulders by which you're going to carry this organization out of where it is now to a better place. And I, I hate to have to do this over and over and over again, but that's the situation I find myself in. That I as a, I, as a white man have to come to an audience of mostly non-white men to tell you that it's on your shoulders to help this organization become better. Frederick Douglass said, the man who puts a chain around another man's ankle attaches the other end of the chain to his neck. And that's what we do in our country, over and over and over again. I don't have to tell you about the school system in certain area of Cleveland versus other areas of Cleveland. We've got the same problem in New Jersey, tale of two cities. I grew up in a school district where 97% of the kids graduated and 94% went on to higher education. Newark, eight miles from where I grew up, 30% of the kids graduate, 2% go on to higher education. People created equally, equal number of talented kids in Newark, but we allow a different outcome. Our country imprisons eight times the average on a per capita basis of people than the rest of the world. 54% of prisoners are black and Latino. Eight times the average, 54%. What's that tell you? When, when white people are gonna become less than 50% of the population by 2043. We're so busy digging our own grave, it's not even funny. So how are we getting out of this? How are we ever gonna get out of this? I'm afraid it's on your shoulders that most of the burden must continue to rest. And it's humiliating to have to say that, frankly, as an American. It goes back, I think, to the tribal thing if you win, I really do lose if we're hunting for antelope. But in an economy, I want you to think about this. If you win, what happens? If we were to bring black household wealth, which by the way is now 1 20th of white household wealth, Pew Research, look it up if you haven't read the report. Black and Latino households were destroyed by the subprime crisis, destroyed. Why? because subprime loans were inappropriate, so inappropriately sold to black and Latino and women-headed households two to seven times as likely as commensurate credit level white households. There was purposeful, targeted, intentional bigotry that drove people into loans that were no good for them and ended up destroying all that household wealth. All those decades of progress, destroyed in a year, just destroyed. We wrote a whole article about Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs not only created this system where they needed more subprime loans because they boosted the interest rate, they could sell those mortgage, collateralized mortgage obligations for more money to their institutional investors. They were successful with this product, so they needed more mortgages and more mortgages, and they incentivized the mortgage industry to write more paper and more paper and more paper. Well, guess what? Unscrupulous mortgage loaner, lenders got into the mix and got those mortgage bundles full of toxic um, uh, loans, and, and look at the mess we're in. Look at the, the gigantic disaster that our economy's in because of this. Goldman Sachs also did some other interesting things. They shorted the collateralized mortgage obligations that they were selling to their own customers. So in other words, they bet, they knew that this was a bad product, so they bet against it. They made money that way. So they made money on the collateralized mortgage obligations, they made money on betting against those obligations, and they bought a company to foreclose on houses. So it would be as if I was an owned restaurant, I, food, I served you food I knew was gonna make you sick, I sold you a garbage can, and as you were staggering out the front door, there was a Luke Visconti ambulance service waiting for you at the curb. That's what they did. So I want you to think about this. What are you hearing? Oh, it's the credit, it's the, it's the CRA, 1977, Credit Reinvestment Act, 1977, that created the subprime mess. It was all those people that got mortgages they shouldn't have taken. They bamboozled the billionaires at Goldman Sachs into get to taking mortgages they couldn't afford. Can you imagine? But it's fear that you could prey on people to get them to believe things that are not in their best interest. 
it is not in America's best interest to have a tale of two cities for an educational system. It's bigotry. Um, have you heard about the N-word head? Have you heard about this? Yeah, Rick Perry's Family Ranch. Yeah, read it, read it. Now, I don't think he was real proud of that. They painted it out, apparently, in the, in the 80s. They got rid of that. They said, oh, you know, look, Rick, if you're going to run for office, you can't really have N-word head painted on, your, on the front entrance to your ranch. Uh, SATs, do you know what the best correlation of SATs is, the only valid one? Number of bathrooms you grew up in, in your household when you grew up. It is completely correlated to socioeconomic factors and nothing else, which in this country tends to shake out around racial lines, which is why the billion dollar organization that puts out the SATs is allowed to persist in what it does. Right? If we took it as the truth and then stepped back and said, but all people are created equally and this test isn't equal, what would we do? We'd invest in the schools, wouldn't we? But no, bigotry prevents you from looking at things that way. Um, progress in an organization requires management to abandon stereotypes. If you want to read a really good book about stereotypes and performance hits that organizations take, read Claude Steele's book, Whistling Vivaldi. He's the provost of Columbia, 30 years of, of psychological research. He spoke at one of our events, phenomenal speaker. If you ever want him to have him out here, he does a really good job. Um, and his book is very readable. It's, it's academic, it's got the charts and graphs and tables, but it's also a very entertaining read. Uh, and I think you'd, you'd get a lot out of it. Um, Promotion of stereotypes cost performance. This is a business issue that you could bring up to your management. And then finally, the problem is you're going to face in life is that there's well-managed things and poorly managed things. And so you have to make a decision for yourself. Work for better managed companies. Do business with better managed companies. Do not find yourself in a situation where you're in a self-fulfilling prophecy of a poorly managed company in this day and age. Why? because wow is the world changing. Here's the change in the middle class. Here's 2000, here's the percentage of the United States, Japan, other Asian countries, India, China. Look at those little two guys there. And now look at where we are here. You can see it's changed and it's changing so dramatically that I want you to think about this from the perspective of if you're making Aztecs, who are you gonna sell them to? Well. Guess what? Mostly non-European people. That's who you're going to be selling them to. And in fact, if you look at the total percentage by population of geographically controlled equivalent money, you'll find that most of the middle class is no longer in the Western countries already. So if you're working for a company and the executive committee is all white men from Cleveland, what do you think your prospects are? They're not good. They're just not. If you're going to a, and you're getting an education from a school that doesn't have a chief diversity officer, like Dr. Mobley, who suffers no fools gladly, right? You have to have some guts to assign a Dr. Mobley to be your chief diversity officer because you're going to hear it from an exceptionally well-prepared and educated standpoint, aren't you? So you can be proud of that here. But you want to go and work and get an education from places that already accept the reality of the market as it is. Not as they wish it to be, not as it was in 1950, which would be way over here, right? Think about that. So that's what I have for you today. I have, you're gonna, I gave the presentation to the university. So th this is, and I don't want you to look at this now. These are two, researchers who came out against diversity and then backpedaled. And one of them I thought made a very good point was that you would assume that people who have a high degree of diversity in their interpersonal relationships then don't have, for example, uh, me as a white guy, I, don't, I have a lot of diversity in my personal relationships. You would assume, well, maybe I don't know that many white people, but you'd be wrong. I know a lot of people, and not all of them are white. And that is the connection, the correlation. Not that you either are diversity or not diversity. You're either an open person who is 
got their antenna up and who is digesting information and turning it into knowledge, or you're not. That's the difference, you see. So you want to go work for a company that is run by people like that, and you want to work with people like that, and you want to go get an education at a school that believes that way. In your current class of 211, uh, the 50 top, that there's no longer a, a Cleveland representative. Well, on the, on the regional list, there are. Okay. And in the hospitals, there are. So there's no, and I'm, I'm refining that further. I note about Cleveland, Andrew. I think Cleveland is a phenomenal city. I think you guys beat yourselves up too much. I think you're too self-critical. You guys have done something that Detroit can only wish it could do. And I like Cleveland, and you guys got a lot going for you, and you have a lot better situation than you think you have. And you should stop being so self-critical and start promoting the good stuff that's happening here, because it is happening here. You can measure it. Look, is it perfect? No. It's not perfect. But you're moving in the right direction where I could tell you, whereas New Jersey is not. New Jersey is becoming more segregated. And boy, the answer to everybody's problem is Chris Christie. <laughs> Look, if you like President Obama and want to see him get reelected, he's your best hope. Because boy, once everybody gets to know him as well as people in New Jersey get to know him, the President will have no problem getting reelected. Just a lot. Yes, sir. And are, there, are there any areas in the United States that seem to embrace diversity more than other areas? That's a great question. That? Are there areas in the United States that embrace diversity more than other areas? The, the answer is going to surprise you. Minneapolis is a great city for diversity. Believe it or not, mostly white, right? Mostly white. And I actually asked the question, I was in an audience, except everybody in there was blonde hair and blue eyed. It was the funniest thing, I'm talking about diversity, and they're all sitting at the edge of their chair and they're taking notes, and I'm like, wow. So I said, well, what is it around here? And they said something, one of the guys said, well, we're very conservative people who think very liberally. We live conservative, we think liberally. I said, well, how does that work? He goes, we'll be the first state to legalize marijuana and nobody will smoke it. And so I, <laughs> So, but there, there are areas. I like Indianapolis. I like Cleveland. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, Indianapolis is doing a great job. Um, I like Cleveland. I like uh, Atlanta for some reasons and not for others. Um, I, I like, uh, you know, Washington has come a long way. L.A. to some degree. New York, not so much. Did you know what the percentage of non-black firefighters was on September 11th? Six <laughs> percent in a city, in a city that's almost seventy percent Black, Latino, and Asian. Do you know what kind of concentrated bigotry and exclusion you have to achieve? The level of performance. I mean, think if you could convert that into baseball, you would never lose. You know, you think about this: ninety-six percent white people, and you know, but another thing about Minneapolis. Higher percentage of women firefighters, not clerks or admin people, firefighters than any other major fire department that I know of. I asked the chief, chief, how'd this happen? And he said, I wish I could take credit, but I can't. He said, in the 80s, a group of women got together and they made sure they mentored every new woman who came on. We haven't lost a single one. I go, whoa, and he goes, well, I said, what do you do now? He goes, well, now we support them and we really hold them up and they're, they're our example. I'm like, well, okay, so you got a combination of, you had a group of women leaders who were nurtured to, to win and it won for the fire department. So there are cities and we're actually going to start looking at this uh, by studying regional companies. There are, there are cities and areas trying very hard. Believe it or not, the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area of Pennsylvania, which is kind of, you know, you think about it, it's similar in mindset to this area in a lot of ways. Um, similar weather in a lot of ways too, but they're very active in this. Uh, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina has become very active in this. Um, so you'll see that, you know, you can look at, now look at the entire state of Arizona. Take a step back. You know, it's just, you know, I, I, don't, get, I don't get it. I don't get it. You, you know, um, a lot of Mexican-Americans will tell you, uh, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. That was part of Mexico, right? So you start thinking about it. How could you hate people that you live with? Boy, it takes a special kind of people, doesn't it? So you think about this, there are areas that have a serendipity. I also think there's a legacy and, and a latency to hate, to hate and evil. Um, Lowndes County, look it up. 
right? So think about this. Okay. So I agree with you that Cleveland is a marvelous city. And it is. As an import, um, I, I totally agree with you that Clevelanders, the natives, I mean, they just really don't know what they have. But unfortunately, I think that the city has been able to sort of stay afloat, uh, maybe not remake itself, but stay afloat um, versus Detroit in spite of um, its commitment to diversity. I don't think it's because of it, it's in spite of it. And so I'm just curious to hear some of your thoughts on, um, on, on how we can embrace diversity more as we as we move forward relative to such contentious issues as regionalism yes um, so i don't know if, I, if i've articulated where i want to go with this question i guess what i'm saying is that it's not it's not going to get any better and so you know what have you seen from some cities that has perhaps you know struggled with Focus on education is the key thing. You need to focus on your public education system and do the best you can to right what wrongs are going on because it's regional inside this city and it disserves uh, certain students and, and serves others adequately. Uh, we do something at Rutgers called the Rutgers Future Scholars Program where we take 200 eighth graders uh, a year uh, and then we keep them until they graduate high school. And we have a 96% success rate in school districts that have a 30% success rate. And it's a matter of just the, that mentoring that they get 12 months out of the year. And then you also learn about things like, uh, things that are unimaginable to me, um, that these kids, to a person, did not think that they were ever gonna go to college. And their parents would tell you, there was no way we thought my son, my daughter would ever go to college. And I know as a trustee, you bring me a child who's reasonably well prepared, I'll find the money from someplace. Someplace, I'll find the money. I'll find it. But the kids were giving up hope in eighth grade. Now what do you do if you're a smart kid in eighth grade and you don't have any hope? After school, you smoke a joint. I mean, frankly, that's the you know, logical thing to do. You don't have any hope? Well, what are you gonna study for? So my point is that, this, that you here, and I think at this university, and then the, the people who are represented in this room, need to think very carefully about public education, and that is the core thing, because I'll tell you why. You can't get businesses to move here, grow here, or stay here if there isn't an adequate labor, labor pool. And you would say, well, look at all the unemployment. Most of the people, U6 unemployment measures people who have given up hope or are underemployed as well as unemployed. It's up there, it's been hanging up there at over 16% since this recession started, which is more than double the, ten year, the average of the preceding 10 years. I want you to think about this. Most of those people have been left behind in their skill set and are really unemployable. So that when you think about expanding your situation in Cleveland, you're starting from a deficit. You gotta move people into Cleveland, especially starting about this month, it gets tough until, until May. So think about that, it does, doesn't it? And yet you are sidelining an enormous percentage of your indigenous talent every year. You're crushing them. And that's not unusual, that's not atypical, I'm not singling out Cleveland. It's the same for poor people all over our country, right? I have a friend um, who's almost my age exactly, and uh, he grew up in rural Mississippi. He's African American. Uh, and he told me about a time that his mom was a maid and his dad was a maintenance worker, and his mom came home crying, and he remembers this distinctly. He remembers where he was sitting, he remembers what he was doing, and his mom's crying because she was forced to work a party celebrating the assassination of Martin Luther King, right? So what could she do? She can't quit. She can't refuse. They're in a small town. She has to work this party. And she has to suck it up because to not do it would mean the death of her family. This family would figure out where the husband lived, worked and get him fired. It would be the end. And so he told me, you know, I'm not the smartest guy from my high school, the smartest black guy. There were guys far smarter than me. There was a math whiz. Do you know where he is right now? And I said, why, certainly, Fred, I know where he is. There's a tree in your hometown where black guys go to drink beer after work, and he's under that tree drinking a beer. And he looked at me like I had been there. And I said, Fred, you're super 
human. You have a strong ego. You have a sense of determination that is far out there, far from the average. That's why you're successful. Your friend, the smart guy, was normal. He was normal. And the discrimination that he faced destroyed him like it would destroy any normal person. That gets me sick when I think about it. You think about all of that talent in this town that you're just gonna rub out like a cigarette that you're done with. That's what you have to change. You have to change that. You'll find that there's chaos in being poor. Some of you know this from your own personal lives. I have a kid I've known since eighth grade. He's now a junior in high school. Get a text message, Jason's mom's dead. I know his dad's in prison. I call him up, I go, what are you gonna do? He goes, I don't know. I go, don't worry about it. You wanna stay in New Brunswick? Yes, I'll get you an apartment. Not a big deal. I know him, I know the kid, he's a good kid. He's gonna be a great lawyer someday. He's just, he just can write and he can read and he can incorporate knowledge, information turn into knowledge, he's a great kid. So you gotta take care of him. I mean, really, if you think about it, dormitory high schools, You've got to help kids get out of the chaos of being poor in some isolated way to help them to think. It's not a popular thing to talk about. It really isn't. It really isn't. But we've destroyed generation after generation in this country, and there's no bringing it back once you get past a certain age. It's very, very difficult. A lot of times when the public thinks about diversity, yes. they think of you know black, Latino, women, uh, veterans, they kind of think of everyone, I guess, except the middle-aged middle white, man. white man. Yeah. Heterosexual Christian white man with no ADA-defined disability. Right. right. Um, <laughs> do you think that in companies' uh, pushes for diversity that this section, this group, feels estranged? And if so, what do you think are the ramifications of that? And what can companies do to help engage the white male or that group yeah. in with diversity and not feel like they're being excluded. There's the Pontiac Aztec of diversity efforts, right? So I want you to think about this. Employee resource groups should be open to everybody. So if your brother is gay, maybe if you're a heterosexual, you go join the LGBT resource group. Uh, I have two little girls my wife and I adopted. They're both Chinese. Maybe I join the Asian resource group. You see what I'm saying? There's a, a a way of looking and managing this, and it's very well defined, you don't have to guess, that you include your white men because they are part of diversity also. I had a hospital system, not anywhere near Cleveland, down south. Um, I had a call from their PR person saying, you should do a, a, an article about us, we're 81% diverse. I said, that's remarkable. Are the other 19% like robots or cats or what, what the, how did you do that? And, and so the woman said, well, but those are where women and people of color added together. And I said, well, I happen to be on the page where your board of directors and executive committee have their pictures. What happened to the 81% there? And she got quiet and I said, you don't want me to do an article about you. It is not the kind of article that you would ever want to see. And so she went away. My point is that good diversity programs incorporate everybody. And there is no American in this country, nobody in this country, even if you've got a green card, you're here, and if, you're, if you've been here for more than a few years, you have a diversity story. There's something in your life. I went to uh, um, Portland, Oregon, and the guy said, uh, the guy calls me up and goes, I need you to speak to police and fire chiefs. It's part of their training. I'm going, police and fire chiefs in Oregon, it's gonna be 97% white men. And he got quiet and he goes, wow, that's exactly the number. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> So I go there, there are 800 police and fire chiefs, 97% white men. So you know what I told them? You don't think you have diversity in your fire department or police department. You got white men who grew up poor. You got white men who grew up in a large family. You got white men who grew up with just their mom. You got white men who went to, to college on an athletic scholarship. You got white men that didn't go to college. You have so much diversity. You have white men whose brothers are gay. You have white men who may have a sister married to a black guy. Whatever it is, you, we as white men stand it down. We want to make it all smooth. That's not your job. Your job is to save lives. You need all those different perspectives. You need to brush them up and make them stand up so that you get all different perspectives. But that's good management. You have to watch and see who's doing good management. And that's the key. There are me mentoring. 
Do you do it just for women? No. Do you do it just for black people? No. You do it for everybody because you don't know if your next CEO by skill and intelligence and capability is another white man. And he might not get the information he needs to rise to that level, which benefits who? Everybody. If talent rises to the right level, it benefits everybody. So that's, I think you ask a really, really good question because diversity programs should be designed and implemented and communications should be extremely inclusive and respectful to people who aren't bigots and misogynists. Uh -oh. Uh, here comes the big hook. So, Help, I'm getting hooked off the stage. Help. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And we have a gift for you. Thank you. And be proud of Cleveland. This is a great city. I love Cleveland. I love coming here. I come here in the winter. That's how much I like you guys. <laughs> So please be proud of your city and help raise it up. Help be the part of the solution of this city going forward. I think you have a real sustainable, you've done the hard work, you got a sustainable city. Don't let it be run by guys who design you the Aztec. Go, and, you, and this is a really wonderful university. So thank you everyone, thanks thank for having me. So